there, Year 3. I'm here to read the next chapter of Kid Normal, Chapter 12, The Legend of the Blue Phantom. 1965. It was the middle of the decade nicknamed the Swinging 60s because of the large number of new playgrounds that were built around that time. As usual, Great Mitten, Britain's most suave and famous secret agent, James James, was taking a long lunch. He sidled up to the bar at his favourite restaurant and beckoned the white-jacketed, brown-moustached barman over with a casual wave of his left elbow. Chocolate milkshake, please, Gaston, he drawled. Shaken or stirred, sir, asked Gaston. James James was thrown slightly by this, but he didn't let it show. Stirred, please, he demanded confidently. The barman turned his back for a moment and then presented to him a glass of milk with all the chocolate syrup sunk to the bottom. James James thought for a moment. Now shake it, please, Gaston, he demanded. A chocolate milkshake stirred, then shaken. Gaston poured the milkshake into a shaker and shook it, which, as the name milkshake implies, is what you're supposed to do. But the super spy failed to notice this, as his attention had been diverted by the woman next to him at the bar. She was wearing a long evening dress, even though it was only lunchtime, and had wavy dark hair that hid half her face in exactly the way secret agents really, really like. The spy slid down the bar so he was a bit closer to her, stumbling slightly at the halfway point. Hello there. The name's James. James James, he oozed. The woman turned to face him with a puzzled expression. James James James, she queried. No, not James James James, just James James. But please, he raised his more powerful right eyebrow. Don't let's be formal. Just call me James. I'm Jane, Jane Jane, said the woman, flicking her hair back over her shoulder like she was in a shampoo advert. Really? asked James James. No, not really. That would be ridiculous, she replied. Jane Smith. James James had rather hoped her name would be something more like Squeezy O Bottom. He was a big fan of a novelty name on a lady, but he didn't let his disappointment show. Instead, he took a long slip, sip of his drink through a stripy straw. He gagged. Ah, Gaston, this hot chocolate is stone cold. It's a milkshake, sir, replied Gaston coolly. And there's a telephone call for you. He handed James James an old-fashioned black phone on a silver tray, although the phone didn't look old-fashioned to any of them because it was the 1960s. They thought it looked really quite up-to-date, even though it was plugged in through all with a wire, which made carting it around on a tray very inconvenient. James picked up the handset, thinking to himself how marvellous modern technology was. James, said a voice at the other end, which he recognised as M, the head of the Secret Service. It was short for Emma. Please, sir, there's no need to be so formal. Do call me James, began James James. Shut up and stop calling me sir, M snapped. She was in a rush and had no time to banter with idiots. Neither did Jane Smith. She took this opportunity to sneak away and later enjoyed a long and successful career as an award-winning architect. But that's another more architectural-based story. It's Dr Nuke, James, continued Emma. He's planted a nuclear bomb underneath London and he's threatening to detonate it unless we pay him 10 million guineas, five shillings and seven pence halfpenny, and a farthing. Money back then used to be so confusing. We've tracked him to the crypt at St Paul's Cathedral. Hurry, James. Don't worry, sir. I'm on my way to save Great Britain, shouted James James into the phone, unnecessarily loudly, causing some diners in the restaurant to look up irritably from their plates of boiled liver. Food back then wasn't great either. After only a five-minute pause in which he tried to work out how much a farthing was worth, the world's greatest secret agent dashed out of the door and down the stairs to his car. He then dashed back up the stairs and picked up his car keys before dashing back down again, unlocking his car and getting in. Gaston finished off the milkshake. You may already know that what St Paul's Cathedral looks like, but if you don't, then please draw a picture of what you imagine it might look like and send it to us. We could do with a laugh. In any case, whatever it looks like in your head, James James pulled outside in his silver sports car and rushed to the door marked crypt. There was a door next to it marked toilet that he was quite tempted by after his long lunch, but there was no time. Save the world first, we later, thought James James, remembering page one of the spy handbook. He eased open the first door and crept softly down the stairs like a stealthy panther, wearing a suit because it was on its way to the Panther of the Year awards. 
At the bottom of the stairs, the secret agent eased open the door and slipped inside. He found himself in a large, chilly stone room. It was lit by glass lamps on the walls. Stone coffins were arranged in rows across the paved floor. Towards the centre of the room was a large metal box and a man with a bald head was standing at it with his back to James James, fiddling with the controls. The spy grinned to himself. This was going to be easy. He stepped quietly forward, tripped over a large white cat that made a noise like a cat that had been tripped over. The bold man ceased his fiddling and spoke without turning around. I've been expecting you. Have you? answered James James before he could stop himself. Yes, one margarita with extra cheese and garlic dough balls, seven half crowns and four tuppence. Threepenny, isn't it? I've got the money here somewhere. He started to rummage in his pocket of his grey villain suit. I'm not the pizza guy, Dr. Nuke. This is 1965, the spy interrupted him. It's me, James James, the world's greatest secret agent, here to put a stop to your evil schemes. Immediately he regretted saying this. His cover was blown. Dr. Nuke slowly turned around. His face was marked by a hideous scar that ran from his left eye right the way down his cheek. He'd drawn it there in pen to look more das dastardly. Stop my evil schemes? I don't think so. Dr. Nuke chuckled, and before James James could move, he whipped out a gun and pointed it straight at James' handsome, chiselled face. There were moments of silence broken only by the distant sound of the cat limping around and saying bad words in cat language. What happens now, then? James James wanted to know. What do you mean, what happens now? Snapped Dr. Nuke. I'm going to shoot you in the face and then get up with my plan to blow up London with this nuclear bum. What did you expect to happen? Well, I thought there'd be... Dinner, said the secret agent lamely. Dinner? Yes, usually Vinna's villains give me dinner, you know. Then they tell me their evil plans, tie me up and leave me unguarded so I'll escape during using the butter knife I conceal in my sleeve during the cheese course. Well, chuckled Dr. Nuke, hard to cheese, Mr. James James. This wasn't bad considering he thought of it on the spot and he pulled the trigger. And there was a bang and a flash from the muzzle of the gun. But James was surprised and delighted to discover that he wasn't dead. The billet seemed to have hit an invisible wall in the air halfway between the two men. It tinkled harmlessly to the ground. Looks like it's hard cheese on you, Dr. Nuke, George James James. Then he squinted. He thought he could see some kind of disturbance in the space where the bullet had stopped, a bluish person-shaped haze. It was see-through and indistinct. That's my joke. You don't get to steal my lines and say them back to me, raged Dr. Nuke. Just for that, I'm going to blob London anyway. He turned back to his bomb and on the control panel, saying blow up London, he flicked the switch to on. The display lit up and numbers started counting down from 10. Dr. Nuke threw himself at James James and knocked him over backwards. Nine, the two men wrestled on the floor, making grunting noises. Eight, your name's quite a coincidence, isn't it? mused James James over the crook of Dr. El Nuke's elbow. Seven. How do you mean? asked the supervillian, digging his knee into the spy's back. Six. Well, you're called Dr. Nuke, said James James, hitting him over the head with a wooden chair, and you try to blow things up with nuclear bombs. Five. Do you know, I've never thought about it like that, said Dr. Nuke, leaping from the edge of the battle area on the secret agent's back and clinging on as he thrashed around. Four. I mean, imagine if you'd been called Dr. Tortoise, laughed James James, hooking his fingers into the doctor's nostrils. Three. I'd never get any fair fast, would I? Laughed Dr. Nuke. Two. But instead, Dr. Nuke went on. I'm about to wipe out London with a huge devastating explosion in about one second. One. Click. Nothing exploded. Both men stopped their wrestle, which they had actually just been starting to really enjoy, got to their feet and turned to the bomb. The bluish outline of someone could now be seen beside the control panel, hand outstretched to the control switch, which had just been flicked to off. As they watched the figure, solidified into the shape of a person in a blue costume. Its face was hidden behind a silvery blue helmet and its torso protected by armour in the same colour. That armour's bulletproof, realised James James, and whistled in admiration. And you can go invisible? The helmeted figure nodded. You got between me and the gun, he marvelled. The nodded. The figure nodded silently once again. They looked sharply to the right. Dr. Nuke was making a run for the door. 
Like a total legend, the blue-clad hero leaped athletically over the nearest stone coffin, turned a perfect somersault in mid-air and brought the bad guy to the ground with a flying scissor kick. Dr. Nuke's head hit the stone floor with an extremely satisfying noise, knocking him out cold. His silvery blue attacker, still crouched in a combat stance, looked back at James James expectedly. Not sure what to do, the spy gave a thumbs up sign and in a slight nod as if to say, well done on taking down Dr. Nuke with that awesome display of hand-to-hand -hand combat. But actually, I had the situation perfectly under control. The mysterious figure gestured impatiently to Dr. Nuke, who was now snoring like a drunken sea lion, then pointed towards the door that led to the stairs. Ah, yes, quite. Let's get out outside, said James James. It's time for Dr. Nuke to have a long piece of um, doctor's surgery in prison. He'd been trying for a pitchy one-liner, but had fallen woefully short. Instead, he talked total gibberish for the two precise seconds. His silvery blue rescuer indicated this was a pitying wiggle of the hat, with a pitying wiggle of the hands, then helped him carry the limp form of Dr. Nuke up the stairs. As they burst into the fresh air, I might just show you a picture at this point. James James gasped. Parked beside his silver sports car was a vehicle that quite frankly made everything else within a two mile ride radius, including the cathedral, look rubbish. It was made of gleaming polished chrome. Its long, delicately curved bonnet led up to an aeroplane styled cockpit. Behind that, stretched across the top of the fuselage and supported by metal struts, was a single silver wing. Huge polished black tyres shone at each corner and on either side of it, just behind the doors, were two long, thin jet engines. James James looked at his own car, of which he was unreasonably proud, and realised that compared to this vehicle, it might as well have been a cardboard box with car written on the side in crayon. The door of the beautiful contraption opened, and the silvery blue hero, had, who had just rescued him from certain death, darted over it and disappeared inside. Just before the door closed, a gloved hand reached out and flicked out a small white card. With a roar, its jet started up and the machine rose swiftly into the air. It hovered there for a moment and then, just when you thought it couldn't get any more brilliant, the engine swivelled smoothly so they were pointing backwards and the vehicle disappeared above the cathedral's roof, leaving a faint curved vapour trail of different shades of blue in the cool early evening air. James James walked over to the scorched patch of road where the incredible vehicle had rested and picked up the card. As police sirens grew louder, he turned it over and read in the neat sloping handwriting, You have just been saved by the Blue Phantom. Bye now, take care.